Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's keynote presentation titled New Paradigms in Moving Toward Point of Care Cell Therapy Services in the Hospital. I'm Antonina Salcedo of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. Our speaker will answer your questions via email following this webinar. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or your, report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I would now like to present today's keynote speaker, Dr. Robert Cruz. Dr. Cruz is a resident physician at John Hopkins Training in Clinical Pathology. He received his MD and PhD degrees from Baylor College of Medicine. As a member of the Medical Scientist Training Program, he also earned a Doctor of Philosophy in Translational Biology and Molecular Medicine. Dr. Cruz will also pursue a Transfusion Medicine Fellowship at Harvard Medical School. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Cruz, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, my talk today. I appreciate your time. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, new paradigms and moving toward uh, point of care cell therapy services in the hospital. So I have uh, no relevant disclosures for this talk. So I'm just going to start by giving an overview of cell therapy today. Uh, hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplantation or bone marrow transplantation is the main cell therapy in clinical practice. It's been utilized now for decades uh, for a variety of hematopoietic malignant malignancies. Originally, cells uh, were harvested from the bone marrow, uh, but today um, it, they're mainly collected by peripheral apheresis uh, post mobilization of the stem cells. Uh, the cells are minimally manipulated. So hematopoietic stem cell transplant uh, largely falls out of the FDA regulations outside of tissue bank registration requirements and reporting of uh, biologic product deviations. Uh, moving toward actual FDA cell therapy products, there are really three uh, main FDA approved products uh, with manipulation of cells on the market today. So the first is called Provenge by Dendrion. It's a dendritic cell vaccine for stage four prostate cancer. Uh, the second is Chemraya. It's a cellular T cell therapy made by Novartis targeting uh, leukemia and lymphoma that expresses uh, CD19. And a very, very similar uh, product called Yascarta by Gilead, formerly Kite. And it also uh, has this anti-CD19 uh, uh, car on the surface. Uh, so let's go briefly over what um, Provenge is by um, uh, as a dendritic cell therapy. Uh, so essentially, you collect uh, by a leukophoresis, which I'll go into more in depth later, from the patient, their white blood cells. It's shipped to a factory where they'll like kind of expand and manipulate the cells and try to activate. Uh, dendritic cells inside of them um, from monocyte precursors. Uh, they'll also add this uh, antigen for the prostate cancer as well as a cytokine to get the dendritic cells active. They're then returned into the patient, uh, usually an IV infusion, and the thought is then the dendritic cells will go to your lymph nodes and stimulate a T cell response against prostate cancer. So even though it's technically a cell therapy uh, for sure, there's actually no genomic manipulation, um, which is a huge difference from CAR-T, which I'll discuss in the next slide. And there's actually a very short infusion time since you're just adding this recombinant protein to the cell therapy, meaning that you can collect on day one by day three or four, just a couple of days later, uh, the gingeric cell vaccine is dosed. 
So CAR T cells, uh, what are they? Uh, so the CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. It's a gene that is introduced inside the T cells to give antibody specificity to T cells in order to recognize extracellular antigens and then activate cytotoxicity and proliferation. Um, it's essentially, while we normally give antibodies today, uh, this almost puts the antibody inside of a T cell and it actually makes it much, much more potent. So as I mentioned before, Yaskarda and Kimraya are recognized as CD19 antigen on the tumor cell, on um, specifically B cell malignancies. And the two main indications are DLBCL, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And on the right side, you can see how a CAR works. Uh, normally, the zeta domain uh, increases the killing and uh, proliferation, and then co-stimulation really drives that proliferation, the maintenance persistence as well, so CD28 and 4 MBB. So uh, what's ahead? Um, that's what's available in the clinic today and what patients are receiving in the hospitals or coordinating. Um, there's also an exciting product for B cell maturation antigen on uh, multiple myeloma cells. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, successful data and it's looking like the FDA might approve later this year one of these products by multiple companies or maybe early next year in 2021. Uh, so I'll just continue expanding uh, CAR T cells in clinical practice. Uh, so far, uh, the solid tumors have been much more resistant to consistent and durable anti-tumor responses by CAR T cells. Oh, this is a great area of interest right now in academia and biotech. A variety of uh, potential solid tumor antigens, and it's possible that uh, cell therapy for using CAR T will keep on expanding for those uh, indications even further. So how are CAR T cells made? Uh, the particular production cycle consists of a leukophoresis procedure uh, where blood circulated out of a patient and returned uh, ex extracting only the white blood cells. You'll then have a, a purification step, uh, usually some uh, counterflow centrifugal eutriation. This is something that a lot of hospitals already have in their blood banks. Uh, just to kind of uh, purify and remove any of the sera or other components that still might be in the product. Uh, that product can then be shipped to uh, um, a company or a GMP and a virus encoding the CAR molecules added to the T cells to put the gene inside. Uh, T cells are expanded in a bioreactor. Uh, they're then kind of concentrated and washed once the expansion's done and then you put it into a uh, do quality control testing to make sure uh, you made what you think you made, and then it's formulated into a product that can then be returned to a patient. So it's a lot more steps than uh, the average uh, drug to make. It's a patient-specific product right now, or autologous product. Um, and in some ways, it's kind of remarkable that uh, this whole entire process has been commercialized. So that was the big overview of CAR-T. Uh, I think on the commercial side right now, uh, this is for Kimraya by Novartis. Uh, it's about from the collection side, which the hospitals organize, uh, it's uh, then a two to three week period where it's frozen and shipped to a manufacturing facility for Novartis, uh, uh, transduced, which means put the gene inside the CAR-T cells, the T cells, expanded for two or three weeks, and then the cells are returned frozen to the hospital and then thawed and infused at the patient bedside. So there's a significant time actually, even from the collection to the patient getting the product. Uh, let's talk a bit more about the starting material, which are the cells, uh, which is really important. In some ways, um, the studies have shown that maybe uh, guides the outcomes of the entire therapies. So uh, the fact that you're collecting from patients and it's a patient-specific product really introduces a lot of heterogeneity. Some people have high T-cell counts, low T-cell counts. Maybe they'll expand better in some individuals than others. And um, so that's actually a huge uh, constraint, both for the collecting side and then the, financially the manufacturing side as well. 
So as I mentioned briefly, leukophoresis, you circulate out the blood that you can kind of see on the right side, and you're only removing uh, the layer that you want. Um, so there's the plasma layer, the cellular layer, and the red blood cell layer. And you can really just remove the white blood cell layer. And what's even more impressive is the spectra opia, a phoresis machine by Terumo can actually just remove the mononuclear cells. Uh, over granulocytes uh, within that buffy coat layer, which contains the white blood cells. Um, so right now, apheresis is the main way you collect CAR T cells. Uh, all the protocols have you uh, having a very significant cell dose that can be collected with phoresis. It typically takes four to six hours, depending on the count of the patient going into the collection. It's really well tolerated, minimal side effects. There is a nurse by the patient the entire time monitoring vitals and any issues. Uh, patients can take naps, watch movies. Um, and sometimes in uh, cancer patients, you might need to infuse some other products post-infusion since the phoresis procedure itself can um, sometimes uh, reduce those components. And you can see on the right, there's a patient uh, being there uh, T cells collected to manufacture their CAR T product. Um, I am a uh, transfusion medicine physician, so I'll be highlighting some of the roles from the uh, transfusion medicine, which is the lab and the clinical side, and uh, try to understand uh, how this specialty kind of interacts with this process. So, uh, transfusion medicine can assess the patient, see if they're able to tolerate the procedure well. Of course, you want to know if the person's eligible to even undergo CAR T cell, their medical history, contraindications. Uh, there are certain uh, constraints with collection of pediatric patients that need to be uh, minded as well. And um, certain collections, depending on the health of the patient, have to be done with an intrajugular catheter, which is in the right side of your neck, uh, versus being collection from your peripheral intravenous axis in your arms. Uh, so the collection goals are really dictated by the companies right now, what they want for make their product. Uh, typically that entails like a minimal CD3 count that the product needs to have in order to ship. And uh, what that means for the physicians on the hospital side is you'll need to assess patients counts going into it and you can relatively mathematically predict what the uh, patient, the yield will be based on their counts going into it. Uh, the central challenge is a lot of cancer patients have lots of chemotherapy, and so they might not have significant uh, T cell counts or white blood cell counts to even collect. And this is really a concern if you can even A, do the procedure, and even on the low side, there might be a production failure if they're not uh, a successful product uh, for the companies to manufacture. This is kind of an open question. The field that's still being debated is what, when should we do the leukophoresis collection? Uh, right now, the paradigms you wait for referral for CAR T cell therapy. So that means failing multiple lines of other cancer therapies. There's also a delay in insurance approval. Uh, CAR T cell therapy costs several hundred thousand dollars. And this can also delay then the collection time as well. And there's an interesting thought is you collected the T cells uh, even earlier than the other lines of chemotherapy. You might have a uh, product that's maybe less damaged from the chemotherapy and they'll be able to expand more. And you can almost think about freezing in uh, kind of like people do for core blood today. Um, but of course, that comes with costs as well. And there's also the question of who would pay for the banking of CAR T cells. So what does the cell therapy lab uh, do currently in CAR T cells? So um, ho many hospitals have a small cell therapy lab. Um, sometimes it's uh, integrated with the blood bank uh, that will receive the cells. They'll perform any testing as necessary to assure that has enough stem cells, it has enough T cells, this is called QA, QC testing. And then they'll follow whatever the product uh, manufacturer really wants for the cells, whether that means freezing or shipping frozen or shipping fresh, or the temperature, um, putting it in the, the canister that the companies want it to be uh, shipped in. 
Um, and then what happens when you receive it, they're really uh, overseeing also the distribution and making sure the thawing procedure works, uh, proceeds and is successful as well. But in general, it's an important but limited role really in the generation of CAR T cells. So how could cell therapy labs have an expanded role for CAR T cells? Um, I, I would say one thought that's interesting is they could have better assays that could quantify the potency of the donor immune cells. And that would be very useful for the field. Because um, right now, there's, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the product. And so if we could somehow test even before one ships or generates the CAR T cells, then you would really know, okay, this person actually benefit and they won't, and that will save significant money for the healthcare system. Uh, and this is a really uh, important area of research that needs to be analyzed going forward to see uh, how we can better predict uh, based on the product who will succeed and who will fail. Um, and it's imaginable that in the future, you could really phenotype patients uh, even before collection as a way to analyze if they will succeed or fail. So uh, another thought is uh, related to the analyzing starting material is um, uh, many transfusion medicine practitioners are pathologists. And as a pathologist, uh, you're well positioned to oversee this diagnostic testing, biomarkers, flow cytometry, even some of the genomic analysis. Uh, so that really fits well in the field uh, as being able to help uh, bridge a lot of the testing in the patient care process. And in transfusion medicine, um, it's readily uh, understandable that uh, you're trying to funnel heterogeneity of patients into a standard predictable response. Uh, and that happens a lot in medicine. Every patient's different. And and certainly our goal for cell therapy and CAR T cell therapy, we have every patient have a similar response. And that would really bridge the role as both the manufacturing side as well as the physician side. Okay, so what happens after the leukophoresis product is shipped? Uh, we've talked about it briefly, but the, uh, there's this manufacturing process. You'll isolate, activate the T cells. Um, so that means they're ready to proliferate and that's actually easier than to put in the gene. The retroviruses work better or lentivirus works better at putting the gene inside cells. Um, the companies themselves will receive the cells. They'll do their processing. Um, and then during their release testing, they'll see if there's any infectious issues or make sure for, certainly that the genes in enough cells and um, there's a stimulation C3, C28, which are kind of fact, you know, pathways that activate T cells. And this process really takes two to three weeks. Um, and then there are uh, a couple of issues actually when you're processing the leukophoresis product to generate the CAR T cells. Uh, one is even though you're collecting mononuclear cells that consist of lymphocytes, so T cells and B cells, monocytes, uh, to a certain extent. So you're getting other cell populations still. Uh, one challenge has been, uh, and there's also a, a risk of getting tumor, which I'll talk about in the next slide, but uh, there have been a lot of significant challenges with this. One is if you have too many monocytes uh, in the product, the CD14 positive cells, uh, it's been shown that the expansion uh, won't happen as efficiently and it would be really favorable to actually deplete the CD14 positive cells. Uh, so this goes to show that there are a lot of ways that even you're getting this raw mixture of different cell types, even if somewhat selected by the apheresis machine uh, in the product and they could still have gains from maybe isolating or removing certain cells. Of course, this adds additional costs as well. This is a really interesting uh, case report from UPenn that showed that um, if you don't, if you accidentally in your mixture of T cells and maybe some other cell types, uh, in this example, they had a leukemia cell still in the bag and it accidentally leukemia cell received the CAR molecule. And it's practically speaking, you can see on the right side from their figure, it really caused the uh, leukemia cells to suddenly be CD19 negative since the CAR molecule almost downregulated uh, the 
uh, CD19 in the leukemia cell. And unfortunately, this led to a relapse of the patient's disease because now this leukemia is re completely resistant to how the CAR T cell was going to treat a uh, target it, namely the CD19 molecule. So again, this shows that the product itself has a lot of heterogeneity and it might even need to be processed as well to remove the th things that you don't want. Uh, okay, so let's say the company uh, got the product, processed it, put the genes in, passed QA, QC, has enough percentage of CAR positive cells. Uh, then the hospitals will go back and receive the product. And uh, this is where a lot of the complexity of CAR T cell uh, care therapy really happens. So the first step is this uh, bridging step where the patient right before the CAR T cells are given uh, receives uh, chemotherapy drugs, um, usually cyclophosphamide, uh, sometimes fludarabine, and, and this causes lymphodepletion, uh, basically really wiping out all their T cells that are already in the body to kind of make a niche for the CAR T cells to grow in and uh, grow well and expand. Um, and so that's the bridging, and now we're in the fusion step where the patient's receiving the cells, and then really there's a mix of early and late care where uh, in the early period, there's this risk of uh, cytokine release syndrome, which I'll talk more about the late, uh, next slide. And then the late care is your follow-up with your oncologist to see uh, what's happening. And then there's some regulatory um, and billing practices that need to be done in order to follow up with CAR patients. So the main uh, concern that happens in this post-infusion period is called cytokine release syndrome, and there's also neurotoxicity, two primary side effects of CAR-T therapy. Um, they're related, but they can also happen distinctly. Um, and what, will, what is necessary is inpatient, often ICU monitoring. These patients get extremely sick, often with intubation, means putting a, a tube down their throat to breathe for them, uh, and then the neurotoxicity, cerebral edema has been noted. Um, and really, uh, only certain centers uh, are able to specialize in the management of these toxicities, which is why CAR T cell therapies today are only restricted to certain uh, centers of excellence, and the company and the FDA will only allow the therapy at certain sites. Unfortunately, through studying the product uh, and the process of CRS, uh, they found a couple of therapies. One's tocolizumab, uh, which can uh, target, it's an IL-6 receptor antibody targeting the IL-6 pathway. It's been shown to be effective for treating CRS. Another drug, anakinra, which is an IL-1 beta antibody, uh, removing this inflammatory cytokines, also been shown uh, to be very promising in uh, mouse models for both CRS and neurotoxicity. Uh, and then certainly as clinical trials uh, provide CAR T-cell patients in medicines, uh, there's even thought that you could have prophylaxis with these agents so that they would never develop CRS in the first place. Okay, what are the current logistical issues and challenges with CAR T-cell therapy? Uh, one uh, simple one that is actually more complex than you think is Tracking, it's a right patient, right sample. It's a very important practice in blood banking and pharmacy and all areas of the hospital to make sure patients to receive the right drugs and uh, therapies, and it's no different in CAR-T. So you're gonna have to ship a, uh, hospitals have their own barcoding system, and then you need to ship it to the companies and they're gonna have their own system because uh, you can't use necessarily the hospital system Obviously, you have to maintain HIPAA compliance, and having two different tracking systems is somewhat cumbersome. Um, and then you also need a, a way to order CAR T cells and integrate it with your EMR as well, your electronic medical record system. In some elite ma medical centers, um, they're also having schedulers dedicated to filling apheresis chairs. Uh, with CAR T cell patients, since this really needs to happen as soon as possible, uh, their cancer might progress and they would die. And given the fact that uh, there's only so many apheresis chairs and nurses, um, this can be a challenge since those schedules are often full already for patients to have therapy. And it's hard to always keep a chair potentially open for a CAR T cell patient. 
So uh, while these uh, therapy, cell therapy logistics are really unique for the pharmaceutical industry, uh, it's certainly not the case of uh, manufacturing a large product in a reactor and then purifying and sending it to patients. They're actually somewhat similar to the workflow of blood banks today and transfusion medicine services that receive blood banks are really well position to solve these challenges since they're used to a donation side, collecting regulatory compliance, um, some manufacturing manipulation in the hospital, and then making sure right patient, right product uh, occurs in any FDA report, uh, reporting after that. So I think I'll leave you, or I'll kind of throw out a question, which is uh, how do we make the CAR T cell process faster and more efficient to patients? So right now it's a bit cumbersome, two to three weeks in manufacturing. Uh, this refers to, and there's a key metric in the field, which is called vein to vein time. That I'll be discussing heavily, which is the first vein is the collection side and the second vein is getting the product and uh, so that's a significant limitation. And then there's another limitation, just referral for CAR T cell therapy, uh, which takes a long time. And insurance is an important factor since uh, uh, you're not going to do the therapy at a potential risk of hundreds of thousands of dollars that won't be reimbursed. So focusing on the, the vein to vein aspect, how do we really reduce vein to vein time? Uh, the first vein, as I said, is the collection of apheresis. Second vein is getting the CAR T cell therapy back. And this is key because the faster we get the cells back to patients, the more uh, the cost of the culture time are reduced the more we even really avoid the delay of life-saving therapies. Um, Cause I, we, there, the patients definitely do die today while waiting for their CAR T cell therapy product to come back. So this isn't just a theoretical question. So there are a few different strategies to reduce vein to vein time. The key strategy would uh, be perhaps reducing the cell dose. Uh, so right now you manufacture for a certain period because you're trying to expand the cells or undergoing mitosis every day. And if you had a cell, lower cell dose required for the therapy, you probably wouldn't need to expand it that much. And maybe if you had trials support this, um, they could give equivalent results. Another thought is you could engineer the cells themselves being more potent at low doses. Uh, and then so it's kind of related to the first one. Uh, you could also collect cell types that are naturally more potent at a lower dose. Uh, with similar efficacy, uh, meaning that you don't have to have such a long manufacturing time. And then the last one is you could really move manufacturing on site or locally, and that would at least avoid the shipping times, which costs uh, a day on each side, so two days total. Uh, so right now, the Freesis products are shipped really uh, across the country to two sites. Uh, there's a location in Santa Monica, California for Gilead slash Kite Pharmaceuticals. And then there's a central manufacturing location in New Jersey for Novartis. And the questions here on uh, reducing when you, uh, shipping time would be, how do we track and receive the cell, uh, the preserve the cells and the products? There's different patient ID numbers, hospital and company related, as we discussed about, and there's a lot of QA and QC throughout this process to assure it. Uh, so highly complicated. Uh, you worry about loss of cells and shipping even, for example. Uh, and then you could shorten the in vitro T cell culture. So it's been observed that prolonged in vitro expansion, actually, while you get more T cells, it paradoxically makes them less potent. And this has been shown in vivo in different animal models and also in vitro. And there's a kind of an interesting study uh, published in cancer immunology research where to examine the potential of C19 CAR T cells harvested early or late in a mouse model and actually showed the day three harvest uh, showed a more robust tumor control despite using a six fold lower dose of CAR, uh, C19 CAR T cells. Whereas the day nine cells fail to control leukemia at limited doses. Uh, so this really goes to show you that there's a, the phenotype is changing of the cells over time and there could be potential benefits actually reducing it uh, than what we're doing right now. Uh, they also noted as their summary statement, limiting the interval between T cell isolation and CAR treatment 
is uh, critical for patients with rapidly progressing disease. Uh, generating CAR T cells in less time also improves potency, which is central to the effectiveness of these therapies. And on a similar manner, uh, we can see this um, technologist removing the cells uh, from the liquid nitrogen. Uh, there's been other studies that shown that these frozen cells post-thaw have also been known to not expand as well as the fresh shells uh, never thawed after collection uh, from the patient. I should note some studies have not been able to replicate this, so this is still a hotly debated topic in the cell therapy community. Uh, some data to suggest that the dose could be uh, reduced was this really intriguing study coming out of UPenn where they ultimately found that only a single one cell was responsible for curing and killing every tumor cell in a patient. So this really suggests that if you can modify intrinsic cell factors inside the T cell, that's actually more important than the actual cell dose. Uh, and you can really see that on the, the bottom, the single clone, which they measure with the DCR uh, locus, actually expand over time to be almost consume or become the entire T cell population. Uh, really suggesting there's a lot more to be gained from the engineering aspects of CAR T cell therapy. And what really comes down to upfront with the cell dose, uh, if you could reduce cell dose, this means that you could have a maybe a lower apheresis cell collection goals up front. You could also move to what's called peripheral blood mononuclear cells. So that could just be an IV donation from your arm and you're not even using an apheresis procedure. Or alternatively, it could afford you to collect a large collection up front, which would achieve cell count goals quickly and within a matter of a couple of days, such that you wouldn't need all the expansion steps since really you'd have the product from the apheresis procedure alone. So the other aspect to how can we make this process better, reduce the cell dose and vein to vein time is collecting the right cell types. So significant research has suggested uh, whether the raw apheresis product with variable mixtures of T cell types is actually the best source for therapies. Uh, there's a company called Juno Therapeutics, which has now been bought by Celgene, that's uh, currently exploring using a defined CD4, CD8 ratio in their CD19 CAR T cell product. So the CD4 are the helper T cells, kind of uh, orchestrating, boosting different cell types. CD8 are your cytotoxic or effector T cells and they're almost uh, destroying the tumor. Although in truth, both cell types have some cytotoxic properties. So they're using also that this defined ratio for their C19 CAR T cell product. Uh, still other groups are explored using uh, T cell central memory phenotypes. Uh, these are those long lived cells from vaccines, for instance, in your body, allowing your immune system always come back to fight a uh, foreign invader, and those might be a better phenotype to uh, put your CAR molecules in They'll last longer. The challenge with proposing these types of therapies is that it's just adding significant cost to have the purification and processing from the initial apheresis product rather than just putting the genes into the product right away. So the next topic is uh, engineering more potent cells that expand in vivo. So there are several strategies that may be pursued in order to make the CAR T cells more potent and expand uh, more after infusion to the patient. Uh, one is there's something called an armored CAR strategy where you can put in different cytokines such as IL-12, 7, and 15 have been explored. Um, you can think about this strategy as almost like replicating the uh, the knockout and the TET2 gene that we just went over in the UPIN trial. Uh, you can also find the 41BB ligand as well. That's been shown to have the CAR T cell more potency, uh, such that maybe you can have a fewer or lower dose. You can also put in a native or chimeric cytokine receptors, such as IL-7 receptors, put in CAR T cells, having better host immune responses. And finally, you can make the CAR T cells uh, resistant to host immune suppression. Examples, TGF-beta dominant negative receptor in order to allow for enhanced potency. 
Uh, and then here's kind of the, the next point or challenge is how you would move cell therapy manufacturing on site. So clearly there are a lot of ways to enhance the product. And maybe if you moved on site, you could have a shorter culture and that might make it fresher as well. But I would say the open question for the field is if we can really move the processing time down with these other strategies to two to four days, perhaps even less, do we really need uh, the entire manufacturing to happen at a centralized location with all the shipping time? Or could we do this centralized manufacturing in-house in the hospital? Uh, because with this short amount of time, it wouldn't make sense to even do two full days of shipping, go through the process of freezing if it could happen really on site in the hospital. So uh, if you think about this, uh, this is an image from Xiofarm. Uh, which is trying to propose an on-site manufacturing strategy. They made the comparison. They have a, a model flying cells all over the country, which can really take two days, occasionally more. Or you can model where you have a manufacturing in the hospital. Patients are in the hospital at the same time, receiving their products in a very short time frame. Uh, so one of the challenge is uh, doing what's called this distributive manufacturing system, point of care system, is that the FDA is used to really approving drug manufacturing and designated facilities and, and you know, factories where you can really expect um, every single drug produced to have the same criteria. And here, if you have a hundred, even a hundred different hospitals producing manufacturing CAR T cells on site. How would the FDA and the companies, for that matter, assure that every patient's getting the right target? It'd be extremely difficult for that to happen. Um, that said, there is a precedent for this because all hospital blood banks, of which many are on site, uh, manipulate biologic and cell products under strict FDA guidelines all the time and give them to patients regularly. So this is uh, completely unheard of, for instance, that the uh, hospitals and the CAR T cell, uh, you know, manufacturers in partnership with the hospitals might be able to do this. Uh, so what are the other uh, kind of concerns or requirements for a point of care manufacturing mo uh, model? Uh, you would need the process to be, uh, you know, really to be standardized and reproducible. Most cell therapy labs use technicians with a lot of hand-based or manual-based protocols, and that creates significant variability. Uh, the GMP conditions that many uh, manufacturers utilize are very expensive, and the capacity is very limited, particularly if you're using a manual process. Uh, these GMPs are very expensive to build. There's specific airflow requirements. Um, there's gowning requirements to go in and out, uh, logging materials that go in and out of the machines uh, and the, you know, the disposables that the technologists utilize. Uh, so this creates uh, a lot of complexity that frankly most hospitals don't have the time, energy, or costs really to even entertain. So what's the solution to these challenges? How could we move manufacturing onsite into the hospital? And the solution is really simple. It's automation. And specifically, it's automation that would allow standardized reproducible methods for generating every cell product. You, the ideal system would really be a closed system, meaning there's no open steps that would expose the cells potentially to uh, bacteria for contamination, for instance. And a closed system then wouldn't have these airflow requirements. You wouldn't require even GMP facilities. You could have it, you know, perhaps in a, a GLP or a semi-normal room even where you have a, a machine that's closed and you have all the steps happen inside. And part of the proposal is many hospitals have a blood bank and there are uh, processes already for blood products being manipulated. And could really fit well inside blood banks, even if there's not already existing cell therapy uh, facility. Uh, so to discuss, you know, a nickname for automation approaches is called GMP in a box. 
so you really want to take everything that's done in GMP and a GMP you can imagine, um, I have a slide coming up, but it's someone in a full gown at a bench and a hood, uh, moving and manipulating the cells. But you want to take that entire process and instead put it in a small machine. And suddenly these GMP facilities, which cost millions and millions of dollars to manufacture, uh, would be available to you know, maybe hundreds of hospitals. And so it'd be all inside a machine that a user can simply program and press buttons in. So how do we, we build a GMP in a box for cell therapy and for hospitals? Uh, the ideal hypothetical instrument could receive a heterogeneous apheresis input. You could potentially wash it prior. That's pretty routine and standard. And then it could perform the viral transduction, meaning putting the genes inside the cells, the incubation expansion of the T cell products, all happening inside the instrument, along with, frankly, the final formulation as well, the product that you can actually infuse into the patient. And then the instruments may be acquired by the hospital-based cell therapy lab in order to meet potential demand. So it has to be within the, the reasonable cost to be acquired by hospitals. Uh, as I was mentioning before, GMPs are a hugely expensive operation requiring air filters, protocols, make sure there's no contamination. Kind of look at the two people on the right side to understand what's happening inside of a GMP. And really only a few medical centers in this country have sizable GMPs to even contemplate doing their own protocols and expansions on site. So if all of them, instead of a, a GMP in a box with a, an automated instrument, that would be ideal. You're no more clean rooms anymore, the no more extensive training on medical staff. And you, again, could really move these activities and integrate them with traditional blood banks as well. Uh, which would be ideal. Um, and then there's a lot of this broader problem as well is regardless of cell therapies, or other biologics, there's actually not enough GMP capacity in this country in general. Um, Moral stone Kettering or MSK is one of the larger cell therapy active hospitals in this country. But it's not uh, possible for everyone to build a large GMP on site. Uh, it's millions of dollars to make, complicated even floor plan that I provided for you on this slide. And even then, like at the current GMP uh, manufacturing sites, it's actually their processes aren't scalable to uh, meet the future demand for all liquid and solid tumors one day. Uh, there's simply not enough people uh, and uh, time, frankly, to make all these cells for patients. And even in the biotech industry, uh, all these cell therapy companies, they really can't uh, scale easily their current models for making CAR T cells to serve a huge capacity in many different tumors. So they also need a new, a new paradigm, if you will, a, a new strategy of delivering patients to cells. Okay, so what's the current state of automation now that I've hyped up its potential, if you will, uh, very much so. And there are several companies that have worked on small tabletop devices for automation of all steps of manufacturing. Uh, I'll highlight here, Militeni Biotech has developed the Clinimax Prodigy, which can accomplish all steps of CAR-T manufacturing from apheresis input to final product formulation. Uh, the General Electric has the Cepheus system on the right side for isolation, harvesting, and formulation of cells. Uh, Lanza has uh, working with Octane Biotech on an automated device uh, for cell therapy. Uh, the Clinix Pro Prodigy has the most published on it, so it will be the primary focus for the rest of this discussion. So there was a study in Nature Communications in 2016 where Fred Hutchinson and researchers in Seattle showed you can use the Clinomax Prodigy to process, transduce with lentivirus and formulate G-modified hypoxic uh, stem cells really within one day to a patient. And uh, this is really actually, they showed equivalent to uh, bone marrow uh, you know, manipulation with longer previous culture uh, methods as well. 
And uh, it's noted that at least for stem cells, the longer the culture actually loses the stem cell-like features, so this advantage would be highly advantageous. Uh, moving to CAR T cells, uh, a number of groups are working on this. I'll highlight here a study at the University of uh, Wisconsin uh, where they showed that you could use the Clinimax Prodigy to make CD19 CAR T cells and also a dual targeted CD19 CD20 CAR T cell using a Clinimax Prodigy device. So this is already showing that point of care is possible at a medic academic medical center and is very exciting for the future of the field. Uh, here's a, an idea or a vision for uh, the Clinimax system, if you will, where uh, you could have the um, apheresis, device, uh, apheresis product fed into the Clinimax prodigy that you see in the center of the figure, and then it undergoes the cell separation activation, expansion, transduction, and then the Prodigy also formulates the final cell therapy product uh, that can actually directly be into the fused patient. It doesn't necessarily by itself decrease the vein to vein time, um, but uh, given the fact that it's happening locally, certainly there's no shipping issues. And if you perhaps engineered the cells or purified the cells or had the right ratio, CD4, CD8, all those topics that we talked about on the previous slide, uh, one could then further use those engineering things to reduce the vein to vein and the manufacturing time on the Prodigy device. Uh, Xiopharm Oncology uh, is pursuing, as I mentioned before, a point of care uh, like trial in a different device that's not using the Prodigy. Uh, so they are piloting a process where you take the apheresis product and you electroporate it. So electroporation, you can think about like zapping with electric field cells that has temporary holes in it where you can slip in DNA inside the cell. So their uh, protocol outline would be Culturing the cells really for like one to two days after electroporation, then infusing back into the patient. And they're using an IL-15 gene to drive expansion and persistence of the cells from smaller starting numbers. And just to explain a bit more about the Xiopharm platform, uh, again, they're making this comparison on the left side, which is the traditional model of flying uh, CAR T cells into uh, the tumor, uh, or sorry, if, uh, flying CAR T cells into uh, this transportation site, uh, and then to the company manufacturing uh, by the company and then transportation back to the hospital, uh, as opposed to the Xiopharm model where you have an apheresis product uh, then you have the modification with the uh, gene therapy here. They're using a transposon called Sleeping Beauty to integrate inside cells, returning it to the patient, and then the patient immediately has uh, the CAR T cell product uh, for infusion. Uh, there's also another platform that's worth uh, mentioning, which is uh, from Maxite, uh, a company, and they're also pursuing a point of care cell therapy platform. So here, Maxite has proposed making CAR T cells using mRNA that would afford for a transient control toxicity for CAR T cell therapy. Essentially, mRNA is this transient message. It encodes a CAR molecule, but only be around uh, maybe a day at most, the mRNA that is. The CAR might be around a few days. Um, so you'd avoid the toxicity since the, the cells would definitely go away over time. In their model, it's similar to Xiopharms in that you would take an apheresis product, uh, it'd be collected, and on the same day, you would um, electroporate the mRNA inside of uh, CAR T cells. Uh, and then you could actually then give it actually on the same day. So they're proposing within several hours, uh, collecting apheresis, processing, electroporating, and a few hours later, giving it back to the patient on the same day. So this would be even uh, the most expansive uh, point of care cell therapy platform. Uh, just thinking about the practical logistics of how to enable point of care cell therapy in hospitals. Uh, so the Prodigy devices cost around 125 to 150,000 right now. 
which represents significant costs. It's not entirely out of question since uh, other machines in the hospital labs can cost a half a million to up to a million dollars. Uh, and while these devices can do all the steps of CAR T cell production during use, uh, no other patient products can be run on them at the time. So really like one product at a time, which is a significant limitation. This means for a, a protocol that runs two weeks in manufacturing, you can't uh, run any other patient samples on the machine at the time. This really makes the shortening production runs that we discussed earlier crucial in order to expand cell therapy capacity have more patients uh, produced on these products. Uh, and then as far as how a cell therapy lab, a blood bank, a hospital would weigh this is they would need to predict what their patient volume would be in order to gauge how many instruments to buy in order to then meet the capacity on their run times. If they know, you know, we'll have this, they need this often, maybe we'll need three machines in order to always have a machine available for patients. Uh, leasing instruments is an option to reduce costs, of course, uh, given uncertain cell therapy volumes, for instance. The cost of disposables will also be important. CAR T cell companies may finance this aspect uh, to deflect hospital costs. So if they're going to have a point of care platform, uh, the CAR T cell companies themselves may actually just buy you the machine and have it in your hospital so that they know you have the capacity to make the CAR T cells. Uh, other practical logistics of the Prodigy, um, really the, the CAR T cell companies would still provide the viral vector. So you could imagine receiving frozen viral vector that then you would load into the machine. They could also provide plasmid DNA as well on any protocols on the machine that might be uh, proprietary for how to make the cells the CAR T cell companies could provide. Um, and in fact, as I just mentioned before, the companies could really just finance a machine since uh, the cell therapy products themselves will cost significantly more than the machines uh, to make them and you, they would recoup their investment quite quickly. Uh, what's kind of unknown if the companies do buy the machines though is if you would allow other companies to use a machine or the Prodigy, one Prodigy, for instance, would serve multiple different companies. If it's the latter model, you'd almost wonder if the hospital's better off having a single machine and then maybe having multiple companies, maybe pay them for it or lease it or have some rights in order to use the machine for production purposes. And while I've focused on the Prodigy, um, it is expensive. It should be cost effective when uh, used for cell reproduction runs for patients to pay back the cost. That said, uh, there are always continuing advances in viral and non-viral vector engineering that might enable machine-free processes, so no electroporation, no machine manipulation, where you just have a phoresis bag, for instance, and then you could add vector to the bag. And this would enable even more efficient scaling. Suddenly you're not talking about expensive machines. And you can imagine, I, I hear the G wave bioreactor where you have circulating rhythmic movement. Um, this does even require like expensive instruments. And then maybe even the bag could then be lightly purified and then given to the patient quickly. Other clinical aspects for point of care CAR T cell therapy. So the patients would need to remain locally in order to receive the cell products on time. Be very important for the patient not to donate and then disappear for three weeks when the CAR T cell product needs to be given. Uh, and if the protocol would have fresh products, it really necessitate a compliant patient and not missing their appointment because if they suddenly are a day or two late even, they're falling outside of the FDA approved guidance for the product and they might even need to repeat the entire process. Uh, many institutions now place and provide BMT patients with local housing. So it's not unprecedented to even have the patient in a ho uh, hotel across from the hospital. So they just make sure they'll receive their CAR T cell product on time. Um, and if the patient becomes acutely sick, uh, managing the condition in the V to V or this brief manufacturing time is crucial, uh, considering you may or may not have as much flexibility. 
you could reasonably have a guidance to freeze the cells if need be, uh, but that's just something to keep in mind. There are, uh, you know, even from a hospital side, significant commercial benefits of on-site CAR T-cell production. St. Jude's Children's Hospital has already announced, and they're probably at this point well on their way to making their own CD19 CAR T-cells on site. Uh, of course, they have a very high-end GMP facility, well-trained technologists to, to manufacture the products. That said, because they have their own product on site, they don't have to pay high pharmaceutical prices three, 400,000 uh, to Novartis and Gilead for the CD19 CAR T cell products, and they'll save significant amounts of dollars. And it's an open question if this would save lots of hospitals money if they were able to replicate this model. So I'll leave you with kind of some uh, outpatient uh, paradigm, future CAR T cell paradigm. Uh, so right now, a lot of the care is inpatient with a significant toxicity. But if the toxicity could really be solved, most treatments can actually be done outpatient, which would really change the field and a lot of the care and complexity that comes with it. So if there's no inpatient ICU stay, it actually uh, would uh, really drive down the cost rather. So half of the current costs associated with CAR T cell therapy uh, there was one study that suggested up to a million dollars. Half of that is the inpatient cost. So removing that would really drive it down. Uh, and then as more patients are treated, uh, you can even have lower insurance charges for CAR T cell therapy, which might drive down costs for the field. Uh, so a summary of uh, maybe this new paradigm, new vision for cell therapy services. And you can have a patient with a cancer diagnosis referred for cell therapy. Uh, my field in transfusion medicine, the physician could evaluate the cell counts, immune phenotype, come up with really a plan for how to time and collect uh, the cells from the patient in order to have an optimal product and outcome. And then you could oversee the apheresis procedure in a cell therapy clinic, which could be both infusion and apheresis. The transfusion medicine physician uh, could oversee this uh, in cell manufacturing in a cell therapy lab. Overseeing the QAQC, any protocol modifications or deviations is necessary. This could be any matter of like several days, maybe over a weekend even if the patient donated on Friday. And then the transmission medicine physician could oversee the infusion of the cell therapy into the patient, really monitoring for any immediate reactions. For most cell therapy products, it's pretty rare. Yeah, for the really related to the frozen products in the DMSO. And then the patient might even receive antibody infusion, like tocolizumab, uh, as uh, necessary to prevent immunotoxicities before they even happen. So transfusion medicine physicians can order then long-term testing and follow up maybe the cell therapy engraftment just to make sure uh, it's still, counts are still there, um, possibly with flow cytometry, for instance. And then the patient would go back to their normal um, community oncologist, and they would then follow or monitor long term to see if the tumor regresses, there's a complete remission, and um, any toxicities outside of the cell therapy product. So uh, transfusion medicine can really assess the patient's status, cell collection, set goals for apheresis, oversee the cell product release, approving dose and adjusting manufacturing time in the lab, and really participate in the approval of all of these indications for cell therapy procedures, almost be a sounding board for different physician specialties. Uh, the technologists running the machines in the cell therapy lab in the future follow protocols for a diverse array of cell therapy products from different companies. They will be able to expand uh, the cells at a capacity to meet demands of solid tumor patients, uh, which would be extremely significant given how many uh, solid tumor uh, patients there are. And I think the real future is actually expanding into regenerative medicine, autoimmune diseases, other areas beyond oncology, which represents a huge patient population that we frankly don't have the capacity to even contemplate making cell therapy products for at this time. Um, precision medicine uh, can be advanced into including customized cell therapies 
for which target patient-specific agents for more successful outcomes, which is really this model of autologous cell therapy. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and um, I appreciate your time and I hope you learned a lot about uh, cell therapy today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cruz, for that outstanding presentation. For additional informative presentations, view our agenda on our events page. As a final reminder, our speaker will follow up with any questions you've submitted via email. Thank you again for your participation. Until next time, bye.